Good morning. Praise the Lord. Let's go Lord prayer. Father God, we come to you today in the name of Jesus. We're so thankful and honored, Lord, we will come and fellowship your presence, hear your word. We thank the Lord for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who saved us, who redeemed us, who delivered us, who gave us everlasting, eternal, abundant life. Thank you, Father God, for our salvation. And Lord, we pray for our nation. We pray for all of our leaders, each one of them hearkening to you. We thank Lord that we have a mighty revival in our nation. We protect our nation, in Jesus' name, from all evil. And we pray for all the nations of the world, that every nation has a gospel, preach as a witness, and then that you come. And Father God, we thank you for all those missionaries out there that's preaching Jesus Christ, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for protecting them, meeting all their needs. That you're using us, Lord, to help them. That they're self-sufficient, possess enough to acquire an awaiter support, and furnish abundance for every good work and charitable nation. And Lord, we pray for all the body of Christ, each and every believer, become baptized in the Holy Spirit, and being taught about who they are in Christ, and going forth in this life, living in victory and ruling and reigning in Christ Jesus. And Father God, I thank you for anointing today. That we will say and do what you have me say and do. Thank you, Lord, for giving me out of the Holy Ghost. And I pray, followers, Lord, as we hear your word and hear from the Holy Ghost, we'll go forth and become doers, word led by the Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Okay, if you have your Bibles, we'll go over here to Isaiah and read some, we'll read some divine healing scriptures here. See where the Lord takes us. Now, here in Isaiah chapter 53, now verse 4 and 5 says, You surely borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem and strictly smitten of God and afflict him. But he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastise our peace upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Now let's go here to Matthew. Matthew's going to refer to this by the Holy Spirit, what Isaiah just said and foretold. Now here in Matthew 8, now verse 16 and 17 says, When he was come, they brought unto him many was possessed with devils, and they cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. That it might fill which both by Isaiah the prophet say himself took our infirmities and bear our sicknesses. Now let's go over here to the book of First Peter, please. And we'll read here in First Peter chapter two. Now the scripture says here in First Peter chapter two. Now the Holy Spirit through Peter is going to put our healing in the past tense. So here in verse 24 says, Who his own self bear our sins, his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Notice those last six words says that by his stripes ye were healed. So that means it's past tense. Words past tense, heals past tense. And we need to focus on that, that we're not trying to get healed or try and get good enough or pray enough or have enough faith and then maybe God will heal us. No, if we've already received Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, we have the God kind of faith. And we just simply reach out with childlike faith and receive what Jesus did for us and not make it complicated. Just take in scripture like we read there in Isaiah and Matthew and, and 1 Peter and begin to uh, see ourselves this way. You know, taking the scriptures and quoting them to ourselves, reminding our, ourselves, this is what God's word says about me. This is what belongs to me. And you know, sir, in 1 Peter 2 verse 24 said we should live unrighteous. Knowing that we're right with God helps us receive from God. Because as long as we think about, well, the reason I don't have it is because I've done something wrong. And think about past sins, whether it was a few minutes ago or years ago. It's going, to, it's going to be a deterrent to try to hinder us. It's called guilt and condemnation. And the enemy brings that back to our mind, our thought process, to remind us, well, you can't get this because look what you did. Well, no, we need to realize we've been forgiven. Actually, the whole world's been forgiven according to First or Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 through 21. The God is already, he's not imputing anyone's uh, sins. That he's seen the world is forgiven. All the person has to do is receive Jesus as Lord. Now, if they don't and die in that condition, then they'll suffer the consequences because they didn't receive their forgiveness. But nevertheless, we want to know that God wants everybody saved. He wants everybody to walk in divine health. I know it's a friend of mine I visit now and then. He's moved, but, and he had some conditions, serious conditions in body. And, uh, you know, now and then as I get, I get ready to leave or during a conversation, he talked, now the reason I'm going through this is because of all the bad things that I did. And so he's thinking about, well, the reason that God's put this on me, that's what he's thinking, is because of sins I committed. Well, what we need to realize is God put the punishment of sin on Jesus on the cross. Not only Jesus took our sins, he took our chastisement. He took our, that word's punishment. He took that on the cross, or God placed that upon him when he's on the cross. So we're not paying for, not, you know, God's not making us pay for our sins. They you do things wrong to people. He may suffer consequences of them. But with God, he's not punishing us. It's not double jeopardy where he punished Jesus, and put everything on him and then punishes us. No, we need to realize that we're not going to face the wrath of God. We're not going to face God for our sins we committed if we're born again. He sees us the righteous of God in Christ. He sees us in Christ. He sees us complete. And that's how we need to see ourselves, not because of our good performance, 
Not because of our good behavior, not because we've been real good little Christians. No, simply because of what Jesus did. And we need to always remind ourselves, uh, there's no condemnation which are in Christ Jesus. I refuse that guilt and shame and condemnation in Jesus' name. But oftentimes, when you're trying to minister to someone, a believer, to receive their healing, they have this going on in their mind, just like this dear man did. He's thinking about the reason God's done this to me is because of all the terrible things. And see, it made sense to him. Yeah, I shouldn't have done those terrible things. Now God's getting back at me. No, this isn't the old covenant for it's eye for eye and tooth for tooth. No, Jesus bore the curse that was on mankind. And think about this. Not only Jesus took our sins and punishment, but he took the curse that came upon mankind when mankind sinned. And that's why we have Galatians 3.13, that Christ has redeemed us to curse the law. Now, how did Christ do that? Being made a curse for us. For his written curse is there one thing on the tree. That's how he did it. And we need to know that we're not suffering. God's not making us suffer with sickness and disease. He's not holding healing back from us because he's already given it to us. Now, you're there in 1 Peter. Just please, just go over to 2 Peter. In 2 Peter chapter 1, we'll start in verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. According to his divine power, hath given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of that has called us to glory and virtue. Whereby are given us exceedingly great and precious promises, that by these we might be partakers of divine nature, having escaped the corruption of this world through lust. Now, verse 9 says here, But he lacketh these things, his blind cannot see afar off, and is forgotten that he's purged from his old sins. See, when a person forgets they've been forgiven, and they're thinking, Well, the reason I have this going on in my life is because of what I've done, then in their own mind, they'll begin to disqualify themselves from receiving healing. And, you know, when we're ministering to people, we need to kind of pick up on this and be led by the Holy Spirit while we're ministering to people for their healing. Because if they're thinking all the time while we're reading healing scriptures and trying to encourage them to receive their healing, if they're thinking all the time, well, yeah, but they don't understand. I did this terrible thing. I had an affair. I had an adultery. And all those things are terrible because it affects people's lives. But it, God doesn't punish the person for it. He put that punishment upon Jesus when Jesus is on the cross. And we're not to commit adultery and fornication. But we need to realize that, that we have been forgiven. And you could do that just with your own mind, thinking on a woman or thinking on a man. Like Jesus taught the Pharisees and thought they were so self-righteous. Caught a woman in adultery, you know, and they're going to stone her. Well, Jesus let people know, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the rulers of the synagogue, the self-righteous people, that if you look on a woman, you commit adultery, your heart, you commit adultery. Well, that, you know, that kind of put away with their self-righteousness, though it didn't. I mean, they still want to stay self-righteous, self-righteous. Well, you see, we're not right with God because of what we've done. We're right with God because of what Jesus has done. It's his blood, Jesus' blood that qualifies us to receive from God. Not our performance, not our good works. Thank God for doing good works. Thank God for being faithful to God. But that doesn't qualify us to receive from God. Our goodness doesn't qualify us to receive from God. Only the blood of Jesus is what qualified us. Now, we were all disqualified because of sin. But Jesus' blood has qualified us to receive all that the Father has. And notice we read there in 2 Peter that he's going to already given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Well, health depends, you know, pertains to life. Paying your bills pertains to life. And God wishes above all things that we prosper. Now, look at this in 3 John here in verse 2. The scripture says here, Beloved, that's you and I, because we're in the beloved, we're in Christ. Beloved, I wish above all things. That you prosper. In all the areas of your life, God wants you to prosper. Socially, mentally, financially, physically, everything in your life should be prosperous and have good health. So he says, I wish above all things. Now think about all the things God said he could wish. He wished above all things that we prosper and be in health, even though the soul prospers. So he wants us to have a sound mind, our emotions be stable in Jesus' name, not depressed, not oppressed, not worried, because Jesus taught us. And told us in John 14, verse 27, let not your heart be troubled, neither let be afraid. It's just good to say that all the time. My heart's not troubled, and I'm not afraid. My heart's not troubled, and I'm not afraid. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled, neither be afraid. In the midst of fear, and feeling the fear, my heart's not troubled, and I'm not afraid. In Jesus' name, my heart's not troubled, and I'm not afraid. Father God, I thank you. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled, neither let be afraid. My heart's not troubled, and I'm not afraid. And just continually say that over and over and over and over and over and over again. As long as, the fe as, long as you feel the fear, talk to it. Re we're putting up a resistance to it. Our first line of defense is that we speak God's word. We decree and declare who we are in Christ. That we're the righteous of God in Christ. We're new creatures. The greater is he, greater is he that is in us than he is in the world. 
and we're perfected in Christ. We're perfect in Christ. We're complete in Christ. Our spirit man is so perfect that the, when we receive Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, our spirit became a new creature in Christ. It's so perfect that the Holy Spirit could come and dwell in us. And God sees us this way in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2 verse 13 and Galatians 3 verse 20 lets us know that we're in Christ. Now we're in Christ. And we're seated with Christ Jesus. So uh, with authority, we have the name of Jesus. And the works that Jesus did in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the church, the body of Christ, the believer, is to do in his name. We're to go forth and rule and reign in Christ. Not over people, but over demons and devils. Like Jesus said, behold, I give you power to tread upon serpents, scorpions, over all the power of the enemy, and nothing's going to hurt you. Well, that's how he wants to live. God doesn't want us hurt. He doesn't want us to be hurt financially, emotionally, physically, mentally, socially. No. We're to agree and declare. And knowing that God loves you, it's, it's, it helps us to live in victory. Knowing that he's not disappointed with us. Just as pleased as God is with Jesus, he is with us. Just like God said, this is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. That's how God's pleased with you. When you receive Jesus Christ as Lord. See, he doesn't see our flaws. He doesn't see our imperfections. And this is what he wanted. This was his design. This is what he did, not what we did. See, when a Christian thinks, well, I, you know, if I'll get my act together, then God's going to whatever, give me whatever I've been praying for, what, or desire. No. He, we just read from the Bible. He's already given it to us. What we want to do is go to work on a receiver, thanking you, Jesus. Father, I thank you that I believe I've received whatever it is you believe you received. And begin to see yourself with it. And begin to thank God that you have it according to your word. We believe receive salvation when we confess Jesus Christ the Lord. Then we can believe God for anything else. And at first, it may have been a little difficult because we thought we was okay because we went to church. But then people told us about receiving Jesus. And then, you know, we had the choice we had to make here. And when we receive Jesus, we receive everything the Father has. We just need to know about it, become aware of it. Like Jesus said, learn of me. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. See, when a believer's burdened down, they're not following the Lord. They're trying to do this on their own. No, we want to just cast all of our cares over on the Lord, knowing, Lord, you're perfecting that which concerneth me, and I think I've turned all my worries and all my cares over on you. Now, we'll be tempted to take them back. To go back to worrying again. But no, just Father God, I think I turn these over to you and I think you're taking care of it. That doesn't mean we don't do nothing. We can stay prayed up and keep praying in the spirit, reading God's promise every day, doing what we can do in the natural that we're supposed to be doing. But nevertheless, the worry part, the concern part, the anxiety, the stress is supposed to be placed on the Lord. And again, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled, neither be afraid. And God is not, we know that from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse Seven, God's not given a spirit of fear, but a power and love and a sound mind. Well, we need to depend on that. And thank God I have a sound mind. And decree and declare, I have the mind of Christ. And remember the just is blessed. I will keep in perfect peace as mind stayed on thee. And the peace of God, Pastor, understands, she'll keep your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Well, we need to keep our heart and mind on Christ Jesus. How are we going to do that? Think about the promises. Listen to ministers and teachers about who we are in Christ Jesus. That gets us encouraged. And of course, reading promises and praying the Spirit and worshiping God, constantly doing that, using doing it like our spiritual exercises. By doing so, it helps us maintain the confidence that God gave us. And here he said here in 2 Peter that he's given us all things that pertain to life of godliness. Hey, praise God for that. That means we don't have to go out and toil to get it. No, it's been freely given to us. And we need to thank God that we, we live in divine financial prosperity. In Jesus' name. And that we walk in the liberty of the Lord Jesus Christ. That we're not in bondage. The devil's always after your freedoms. He wants to take everything you think you got that you enjoy away from you. So what we're always going to do is resist that. He first of all brings guilt or ignorance, not knowing what belongs to us in Christ. And then also taking advantage of that. And then bringing condemnation to a person. Look, look, you can't get that. Who do you think you are? Or making them feel bad for trying to believe God for something good. Well, you know, you've got enough. Why have the best? You know, people's attitude is, why should I have the best when the other will do? Because God wants you to have the best. He gave you Jesus. He wants you to have everything he has. Look how Father God lives. As it is in heaven, so it be on this earth. It's God's will that we prosper financially and have good health. It was God that made us an heir of Abraham's blessing. This is all God's idea. This is how he wants his children to live. Just like you had children, you want them successful, you want them prosperous, you want them, you don't want them to struggle. 
No, you want them to be able to know that that everything you have belongs to them. And with our Father God, he's freely given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And every day of our life, we need to constantly remind ourselves of that. Thank you, Father God. I praise you. You wish above all things I prosper being hell. I thank you, Lord, I'm prospered. The scripture says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, for you know through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, why wouldn't God want you to be prosperous? What's wrong with money? You know, so often Christians suffer so much, like there's something wrong with being prosperous. It's our Father God that made Abraham rich. It was God that made Solomon rich. We have better covenant than they did. It was God that made David, David rich. It was God that gave Job twice as much as he had before. And we're his children. He wants us, you know, we were lied to by preachers and denominations telling us, you know, we should take a vow of po- poverty. Poverty is of the devil. Poverty is Satan's friend. He tortures people's lives of poverty. And there's no sense of being shameful because you're prosperous and hiding your blessings. No, just knowing it came from God. He's the one that blessed me with him. God didn't care how many cars you got. Just because someone else doesn't have anybody have a car. That's not the point. God wants to, he said we'd have wealth and riches in our house in Psalm 112. And God's given us all that he has. He's given us the best, the old covenant, and we got the new covenant. We're born again, spirit-filled believers. There's nothing wrong with being rich and prosperous and financially successful. You know, what we need to do is get the gospel out the world and let people know that if you're poor, start tithing. You know, if you're collecting soda cans, tithe off that and just begin there. Let them know that when they tithe and they give, they put in action laws of prosperity. There's laws of poverty. There's laws of prosperity. And there's laws of poverty. You know, go to bed, thou slugger. You know, being lazy. Well, you could do that just by being lazy with God's word and not taking advantage of your covenant. Think about the guy who had one talent. He dug a hole and buried it. Didn't even use it. But the other one had five. He went and gained five more. And the other one had two. He gained two more. Who got commended for doing it? Who got rebuked for not doing it? God's given us the power to obtain wealth. If he didn't want us to have wealth, he wouldn't have gave us power to obtain wealth. He just said, remember, Lord thy God, to give you all these godly houses. He promises houses and lands in Mark chapter 10, verse 29 and 30. And it belongs to every believer. But the believers had this mindset that, you know, I shouldn't have this. I'd feel bad about it. No, f- feeling the guilt resisted in Jesus' name. You have to resist guilt all the time. All the time the thoughts come to you of lack. In the midst of that, begin to clear and clear your prosperous. And take steps of faith. Face the fear in Jesus' name. And decree and declare that who we are in Christ Jesus. And boldly just creed, this is what Jesus did for me. I'm an heir of God, heir of Abraham's blessing, and I praise you, Father God, and I thank you for these blessings in Jesus' name. And just, you know, be a blessing to other people. Let's see people try to shame people <clears throat> for being prosperous. You know, I know, just travel around preaching. I wouldn't, you know, reading 3 John verse, verse 2, I wouldn't get invited back to the church to preach again. Sometimes, you know, one is the pastor got up and rebuked me from the whole congregation, letting the people know that's not, you know, in other words, that's not, that's not true. But it is true. God wants you to be prosperous. He doesn't want you to live in lack and poverty. Jesus came that you might have abundant life, not struggling life. We're already we're struggling. He didn't come to, Jesus didn't make, come and make our life harder. He, he came and redeemed us from poverty. Poverty is a curse in Deuteronomy 28. It's listed as a curse. So sickness and disease. It's not a blessing to be poor. It's not a blessing to be sick. But some people choose to go without. Because that's their choice. But that doesn't shouldn't affect the rest of us. We need to realize that the more we have, the more we can be. We don't even I owe an explanation why we're prosperous. We don't have to come excuse why we're prosperous. When people say something and try to put guilt on you, you don't owe an explanation. You don't know excuse. No more than you know excuse because you're saved. You know I don't apologize being saved. Why would I apologize being prosperous and healthy? We don't know excuse. You know, pray for the people. Believe God, their eyes be open up. But just some people are just flat out miserable and they're going around and they go around and dump guilt and condemnation on other dear people. And so often people that and believers that don't know who they are in Christ, they begin to accept that guilt and condemnation. Don't be ashamed because you're prosperous and you're healthy and the world's going to hell in a handbasket. No, what we need to do is keep praying for those people, just like people prayed for me. Pray for those people and keep witnessing to them, be a blessing to them. Just because most of the people aren't saved in the world doesn't mean we shouldn't we shouldn't be saved. 
And we should, nor should we apologize for being saved. We don't apologize for being born again. We don't apologize for being baptized, Holy Spirit speaking in tongues. Look at my people's against tongues. That's their problem. You know, love on the people. There's no sense getting a cat fight over it because they're not understanding it anyway. But what we can do is pray for people and keep praying for ourselves, praying God's word, speaking God's word, claiming God's word, taking scripture like that every day and use it in our life and meditating on God's promises over and over again. Because the devil's very cunning how he tries to come in and rob you of your blessings. For everything from condemnation to guilt to ignorance to shaming you, using other people to rebuke you. Nope, just praise God. Thank you, God, for this. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I mean, praise God for this. We have this in Jesus' name. Oh, boy, I tell you. One time I had to go, I went to go, I had something else I had to do. Seminar or something else. I stopped by to visit my mom. When I was at the airport, I rented a, a you know, get, rent a car. Well, this, <clears throat> excuse me, this lady is typing in all the information. You know, she goes, uh, well, Mr. Mr. Rich, she goes, uh, we got this brand new, I don't know what it was at the time, you know, uh, uh, Lincoln Continental, something like that. It just came in. No one's even driven. I mean, delivered it here. But so how about if, how about we just upgrade you to that? And she, she's typing this all in until she's talking to me. And you can just get this car. So this little, you know, tiny car you got. So, okay. Actually, I was, you know, I really, really think what, what she was saying about it. That's some other things I was thinking about. So anyway, like, of course, my luggage. <laughs> so anyway, she types this all in. I grab my bags and I go out to the lot there, Hertz, whatever it was, looking for my number. And I find this car. Throw everything in the trunk, throw it there, you know, and drive over to see my mom. Well, I told my mom, listen, mom, I'm just stopping by for a day or two. Got the seminar I got to do, whatever it was going to. And please don't tell the relatives I'm here. You know, you know oh, I won't. So uh, anyway, so I show up and at my mom's house and I park in front of her house and I, I just I should have just run into Rolls Royce and just pulled in front of her. I mean, this is my hometown. I just you know I just I've had people saying all kinds of things. I can't, a guy's never going to make it and all this other stuff. So one by one, relatives were coming over and I thought this is weird. You know, my mom's had to say something. So so I'm sitting out on the porch summertime and one of the relatives stopped by there and they're sitting there. And, and they keep looking at that car. It's parked right there. They keep looking at that car. And they said, so uh, how's the ministry doing? I thought, okay, now this is all this is all set up. Uh, that's a kind of fancy car. Said, what kind of car is that? Now, they know what kind of car it is, you know. And you thought I drove up in a Lamborghini, which would have probably been better. But anyway, I said, uh, a Ford? <laughs> that got them upset. Yeah, it's a Ford, okay. How much does that cost you? Now, see, they're wanting to know. They're, they they want more stories to tell. Now, the car cost me fifty everything, tax and tolls and everything else, fifty six dollars for all that time I had it, three or four days. I was a total price. I ain't tell them that. You know, let them think. You know, whatever they're they're, they're going to think what they're going to think anyway. See, that's just a way the enemy comes in. Trying to make you feel bad. Why? They wanted me to say, oh, well, you know, I got up there and I had the little red car and it was a Yugo. And they said, why don't you take this one? We'll give it to you for the same price. It's only $56. That's what they wanted to hear because that was going to make them feel better. They go, oh, oh, OK. It was only $56. Oh, OK. Nah, I'm not I'm not touching. I grew up in lack. I'm not touching that. That's bait. That's poverty bait. Mm -mm. I don't know an explanation. <clears throat> You know, I don't know anybody explanation why I'm saved, you know, or why I'm a preacher. You know, people are going to, those are baits that Satan throws out. Yeah, you answer people what you want to answer. But I'm not apologizing because I haven't done anything wrong. I didn't, you know, but I'm not going to tell them that. Let them think what they want to, people are going to think what they want to think. You know, Christians so often in church are like, you ever go down to shore and you see some guy and he's catching hermit crabs and he's got a big five gallon bucket there usually white, and you look inside, there's a bunch of hermit crabs in there, and they're all trying to crawl off to get out. And one of them almost gets to the top, and another one comes along and pulls them back down. Now, first, you know, you may tell the guy, you know, until you know better about this, you know, hey, you probably put a lid on that, they'll all get out. I mean, they're like frogs, they can get out, you know. Oh, he says they won't get out. As long as there's more than one, one fisherman said, as long as there's more than one, he'll keep the other one from getting out. Told, whoa, that's the way Christians are, man. They find someone just about ready to climb out of poverty, they'll bring him back down. Or someone just ready to get out of guilt and shame and condemnation, they'll try to bring him back down. How could they do that? Tell them about their past sins 
you know, and you're, you think you're somebody and all this. That's all bait. And Satan uses that to get the believer discouraged. Love everybody. Walk in love. The best thing you do for them, pray for them. You have to answer people the way God leads you to answer people. But I'm not touching it because it's never going to come out good. No matter how much you give up, there'll be someone else thinks you give up more. Everyone's got their own interpretation how prosperous you should be and what a good steward is and what walking in love is and what being kind is. And you don't, you don't have to do any of those things to be right with God. All you have to do is receive Jesus Christ, Lord. The gospel is Jesus and Jesus only. It's never you. It's never me. It's never based on what we do or don't do. That's not the gospel. That's a lie. The gospel is Jesus and Jesus only. And that's how simplistic the gospel is. Simply receiving Jesus Christ as Lord. Never trying to be good. Never trying to be, I'll be faithful and God's going to bless me. Uh -uh. Be faithful, Lord. Praise God. I believe in being faithful. I think I can prove it. But follow what Jesus did and receive all that he did. And just enjoy the blessings that God has given you. And just keep decreeing and declaring every day. I'm prosperous. I'm healthy. I'm blessed. In the midst of the fear, feeling the fear, feeling the shame, the condemnation, the guilt, the worry, the stress, and what everybody else is saying about you. Boldly decree and declare to yourself, I am what God's word says. I am the rights of God in Christ. I'm prosper. And I always have more assets than I do in liabilities. Everything I touch is prosperous in Jesus' name. And boldly decree and declare. Sure, people get stirred up. They're going to get stirred up anyway. You'll never be able to please people. But you can always please God. It's not like you try to displease them, but they could be like the crab that brings the other one down. Father God, we pray today in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, for all of our blessings. You've been so good to us. Thank you, Lord. You saved us. You delivered us. You redeemed us and gave us everlasting, abundant, eternal life through Jesus Christ. Amen. Have you received Jesus Christ, your Lord? Maybe you're not sure. Or maybe, you know, you've never done it. God wants you to receive his son, Jesus. It's real simple to do it. The Bible tells us how to. <clears throat> Let's go over to Romans chapter, if you have your Bibles. Romans chapter 10. Now, verse 9, verse 10, verse 13. I'm going to read the scriptures. I'm going to ask you to pray a prayer with me to receive Jesus Christ the Lord. Now, the Bible says here in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, verse 10, verse 13, that if thou shalt confess in the mouth of the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in the heart God has raised the dead, thou shalt be saved. For at the heart man believes righteousness, at the mouth confession means salvation. For whosoever calls him the Lord shall be saved. I did this one day. I went to a church and I received Jesus Christ, my Lord. Next Sunday, I went back to my church I grew up in. I said, hey, I went to this church last Sunday night. And I got saved. You know what they told me? The church I grew up in. You didn't need to do that. I quit going to that church. and started going to the church where I got saved at. Don't let anybody keep from getting saved. Don't let your thoughts, anybody else, keep receiving Jesus the Lord. Pray this prayer with me to receive Jesus Christ the Lord. Say these words with me and mean it. And you receive Jesus Christ the Lord. God, God, I come to you today to receive Jesus Christ my Lord. I believe in my heart and I confess my mouth that Jesus the Lord. I believe Jesus crucified took my sins on the cross, took my judgment of sin, died, was buried, and raised the dead. God, I receive Jesus Christ, my Lord. Jesus, I receive you today as my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me. And thank you, Jesus, because your blood and your salvation that you gave me, I'll never go to hell. In Jesus' name, amen. You prayed that prayer. The most important part is confessing Jesus the Lord. And by doing so, now you're saved, whether you feel like it or not. I would encourage you, if you don't have a Bible, go buy one and start reading the Gospel of John. The table of contents will tell you where it's at. And also find a church to go to. Pray about it and ask the Lord to show you. A church to go to that believes that Jesus is the only way to heaven. And these messages here are helping you on a you know daily basis. Then keep watching and keep learning about what Jesus did for you. But that church will help you grow and develop spiritually and get involved with them. you got a prayer request. You can email them if you'd like to, if you want me to pray with you, at jessierichministries.com. We have conference call tonight. It's church on the phone. At 7 o'clock. That phone number and access code should be right here on your Facebook page or on my Facebook page. Take advantage of that. Call in, call in early and fellowship the saints. That's always interesting. Till next time, Brother Rich, mind you keep watching, keep learning about what Jesus did for you. And remember, Jesus is always more than enough. <laughs>